Welcome to Electron Line, and the next video here, continuing with particle physics, is on the 1930s. And by the 1930s, there were additional particles being postulated. So far, they realized that an atom consisted of a proton, a neutron, an electron, or a combination thereof. But yet, by studying this more and more, they realized there may be more particles than just those three. For example, in 1920, Paul Dirac developed a version of quantum mechanics incorporating special relativity. So quantum mechanics is the study of the mechanical behavior of small particles, but because they're so small, there's a very unique behavior. So a new field of study in physics called quantum mechanics came about. And when he took that quantum mechanics, the way small particles behave, which is very, very different from large particles like the everyday life that we experience, we know that when we shoot a cannonball at a solid wall, it probably will not go through. But in quantum mechanics, a small particle can actually go through a solid wall. Inexplicable, but yet it does. There's a probability that it will. And it turns out that this began to be understood, and people began to come up with the physics, the equations, the mathematics to describe this behavior, and that's the field of quantum mechanics. But when Dirac then combined that with special relativity, a very strange result came out. From his equation that he developed, he realized that there must be such a thing as a negative energy state for an electron. Now, they couldn't explain that. It's almost like being below ground level and yet being existent. And so that didn't seem to make any sense. How can a particle be at a negative energy state? So they worked out the equations and said, well, the only way that we can really describe that and explain that is to assume that there may be such a thing as antimatter, a different form of matter. For example, a positive electron. Same mass, same everything, but a positive charge. At the time, they didn't know that existed, but they postulated that. And it turns out that for the work that he did, he received the Nobel Prize in 1933, along with Erwin Schrödinger, who came up with an amazing event. He came up with the ability to mathematically describe the wave motion of very small particles. Small particles, we discovered, don't just fly in a straight line. They actually f move like a wave, very much like electromagnetic radiation. And the boundary between electromagnetic radiation and real particles began to be very fuzzy. It turned also out that in 1905, uh, Einstein discovered through the photoelectric effect that light or electromagnetic radiation was actually made up of small little particles called photons and so there began to be this relationship between photons being small particles and small particles behaving like photons because they both seem to have this wave-like property and Schrodinger was able to come up with equations to describe that motion to describe the existence of small particles within confined areas by by this equation also showing that existence beyond finite boundaries can be possible for small particles as well again part of the quantum mechanics but when Dirac combined that quantum mechanic event that quantum mechanic uh, signs with special relativity he discovered there must be another form another state of matter called antimatter such as negative protons and positive electrons well between, between Schrodinger and Dirac, they shared the Nobel Prize in Physics for Atomic Theory in 1933. In 1932, Carl Anderson actually discovered the positron. In 1936, he received the Nobel Prize for that. How did he discover that? Well, a very clever event. He took very high energy photons, very high energy radiation, and shot it at a thick boundary of lead, solid lead, and some of those photons would actually make it through a small percentage of them and on the other side it would have a strong magnetic field and when the particles this event created particles so the idea that particles cannot be created or destroyed was here shown not to be the case a photon could actually turn itself into two separate particles one that appeared to be an electron one that appeared to be the anti-particle of the electron, the positron as it was called. So this was called the positron and this was called then the electron. And the reason why they knew that existed is because the behavior of the two particles was exactly the same. They would assume to have the same kinetic energy. They would then have the same curvature because they would be affected by the strong magnetic field. But because one particle was positive and the other particle was negative, the positive particle would bend in one direction, the negative particle would bend in the other direction, showing there were two of the same type of particles, 
one positive, one negative, and when they examined what those were, they knew this was electron. This had to be the positive particle of the electron, the positron. That discovery earned him the Nobel Prize in 1936. So 1930 was a big decade for the discovery of an understanding of particle physics. All of a sudden we realized there were more particles than just the proton, the electron, and the, um, and the neutron. And so additional particles were beginning to be postulated. And so now all we had to do was go out and try to find them, try to discover them, trying to find some way coming up with an experiment that could show us that these particles existed. And so the beginning of modern physics Understanding particle physics began during the later part of the 19th century, the early part of the 20th century. It was on full force in the 1930s, people discovering these things left and right. So at this point, we're beginning to realize there's a whole new structure out there that we weren't aware of that makes up matter. And if you're more and more interested, stay tuned for the next videos and we'll show, slowly show you how this all came about and what the eventual structure is of particle physics.